We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, good evening, everybody, depending where you are. Welcome to IGF online session. And I would like to introduce uh, my- in North... Guys, uh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah, uh, I can't hear me. I can't hear you. Maybe I can uh, end this uh, video call and maybe come uh, again. Is that OK? okay. Yes, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. I'm coming again. But I still can continue. OK, so I'm Narmin Ablova. I'm a practicing lawyer and board member of Young Lawyers Network Azerbaijan. And today I will be serving as your moderator. Our online session, as you can see, will be on the topic of Trust Me, I am a seller regulating online business accounts. Uh, that, which is organized by uh, Young Lawyers Network Azerbaijan uh, with the help of international team. We will have an inter interactive discussion around three uh, policy questions. Uh, the first one, uh, can you, Elnor, switch to the uh, slide to the policy questions? So uh, the first one will be on how must the online business accounts on social media be regulated in emerging digital markets to ensure their reliability, prevent tax evasion, and protect consumers from fraud. The second one will be what technical and legal measures have been and must be taken by uh, social media companies or governments uh, to ensure smooth operation of the online business accounts without prejudice to personal data protection and the last and the third one will be on what legal and other remedies are and must be available to compensate the damage to consumers by uh, fake business accounts. So that uh, around these questions, we will have an interesting and informative uh, expert. So I would like to present our speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be Azad Mamadli. He is an in-house lawyer in hospitality industry and blogger on uh, competition, consumer rights, and public procurement law. Uh, our next speaker is Catherine Moresh from Germany. Uh, she, she graduated recently with a law degree from the University of Constance and a law clerk at a district court in Germany. Uh, and our next speaker is Kauri Kar from Costa Rica. Uh, she is a master's student at uh, Technic University of München. And our uh, last speaker is uh, Shradra Pandey from India. Uh, she is a law and policy student at the National University of India. So uh, we will also have an online moderator, uh, Nazaket Bayramova, and rapporteur of this session, Elnur Kerimov. Uh, before we started, I want to give you the uh, information about the structure of our session on each uh, policy question. Uh, Post a question, uh, two speakers will uh, talk about the questions and following that the speakers will answer your questions on the time available, but um, at the same time we will have an overall uh, Q&A session in the end. In order to ask your questions, you can raise your uh, hand uh, function on Zoom, or if you have any internet problem, you can write down your questions. Now, uh, moving along to our session, uh, please welcome Azad Mamad Lee and Katrin Moresh, which uh, they will uh, have a discussion on the first uh, policy question that I mentioned before, which is how must the online business accounts on social media be regulated in emerging digital markets to ensure their reliability, prevent tax evasion and protect consumers from fraud. So the first floor is Azad, yours. Uh, thank you, Nermin. Uh, hello all. First, uh, I'd like to greet all session participants and uh, all listeners 
and thanks uh, to organizers for uh, this opportunity uh, for this potentially and hopefully uh, fruitful discussion. Uh, well, it's not a secret that the rapid emergence of uh, social network tools and uh, and the increasing market power of social media companies uh, brought with themselves uh, some uh, a couple of challenges as well. Uh, regulation of social media is uh, one of those challenges, although it mainly comes up uh, with regards to uh, human rights issues uh, such as uh, freedom of expression uh, or uh, right to privacy. Uh, regulation is also uh, often sought uh, to protect uh, consumers from fraud uh, in transactions on social media. And uh, as a competition law enthusiast, I'll try to focus uh, today uh, on, the, on the last part of this question, uh, the protection of consumers, which is uh, at the heart of uh, main competition law systems in the world. Um, First, let's start with this question, uh, regulation or no regulation? Uh, that is, we are talking about uh, how social media companies and online business accounts operating through them uh, should be regulated, but uh, should they be regulated in the first place? Uh, for ultra liberals and the self-help supporters, uh, social media companies, uh, as well as the uh, uh, online businesses uh, operating through them should not be regulated at all or, or should not be regulated at least by state, uh, but for other major views, uh, they are supportive of some sort of uh, regulation uh, on, on social media companies. And uh, I'll try to walk you through the solutions proposed for uh, this regulation problem on, on, on social commerce. Uh, first, I think we can talk about uh, self-regulation. Uh, I think if uh, applied uh, sincerely and comprehensively by social media companies, uh, self-regulation is the best tool to, to deal with uh, uh, consumer rights violations because with this, uh, those uh, social media companies uh, would avoid uh, unnecessary state intervention and plus uh, this would play a role of a one-stop shop uh, for, for consumers as, uh, as they wouldn't seek any additional external uh, assistance uh, uh, in this case. Um, I think we can say that day by day, social media companies um, get more mature uh, to tackle the uh, consumer rights problems. Uh, but uh, how? But we can. It's also easy to say that uh, the, the, these efforts of social media companies, first to protect their users and, and second to, to compensate them, are quite limited sometimes. For example, uh, the social media platforms. Uh, provide uh, verified accounts with badges or ticks, uh, but we are, we are still uh, not fully able to differentiate between the, between the sellers we can trust or, or, or we cannot trust. Uh, another example is the help pages of, uh, of social media platforms. Uh, they, they do provide uh, detailed information about how to prevent uh, fraud or other uh, illegal activities uh, on, on social media, but uh, but they offer little advice uh, about how to get compensation if you get uh, if you if you fall a victim of uh, of these kind of illegal activities. So I think uh, social media companies uh, can employ um, dedicated algorithms or, or machine learning technology more uh, to raise red flags to detect. Uh, these uh, these violating accounts to block them, but also with assuring that they can voice their uh, valid objections as well. Um, so I think all these show that <clears throat> uh, self-regulation in itself alone is not perfect and uh, uh, should be complemented uh, uh, by some sort of external action uh, or uh, external control, which uh, which uh, brings us to uh, to the uh, enforcement by public authorities or, or private bodies. Well, uh, I'd say that the e European Union is leading the way recently in enforcing uh, consumer rights on social media. In, for example, in 2018, the European Commission adopted uh, a new policy package called New Deal for Consumers, uh, which provides more transparency on online marketplace and also very importantly on search results. Uh, and also it gives uh, consumers some tools to um, enforce their rights and get compensation. 
Uh, an important direction of uh, enforcement is cooperation and collaboration between um, all stakeholders uh, on, on this matter, on social uh, social media matter, uh, which include uh, uh, predominantly uh, social media platforms and uh, state authorities. Uh, this requires many times. This requires uh, social media platforms share uh, information about uh, users, about accounts, and and the violations have taken place on their platforms with uh, state authorities. Um, to to uh, to make sure that the uh, law enforcement activities uh, are carried out uh, effectively and swiftly uh, in maybe uh, fast track procedures, uh, but we can say that uh, this is this is already done uh, with regards to social media activities uh, that include hate speech or, or, or racism. So why not in the in the com uh, in the field of consumer rights protection? But you can see that the social media uh, companies act reluctantly uh, when it comes to uh, disclose such information. Uh, and I think that consumer associations uh, can play a, a vital role in, in the protection of uh, users' rights. Uh, and, they, and, and I think they complete the uh, triangle of cooperation between uh, uh, stakeholders and, uh, and the with, so, sorry, between state uh, authorities and social media platforms. But when we talk about cooperation, we shouldn't forget how much uh, international cooperation and collaboration uh, can offer uh, to fight against, uh, 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 against violations of consumer rights online. Uh, a better international network uh, uh, can, can bring uh, authorities from all over the world to, uh, to, to act against um, cross-border consumer uh, violations, uh, online consumer violations, and can reduce uh, possible bad effects of uh, purely national laws or purely national interventions, uh, and simply can, um, can set uh, good examples, good practice standards uh, in fighting against uh, these uh, consumer rights violations. Uh, finally, we face this question, okay, what happens if social media companies don't act in line with consumer protection law? Uh, then the regulation of liability comes into the scene uh, in, this, in this scenario, but the uh, liability regimes uh, differ from one jurisdiction to another. For example, in the United States, uh, this regime is more liberal, uh, but in China, it's more restrictive. Uh, in, in, in European Union, uh, the e-commerce directive uh, uh, determines a large block of exemptions for uh, from liability for illegal activities, but the Court of Justice of the European Union and other institutions of the Union uh, has narrowed this block uh, very uh, significantly, in a significant way. Um, for instance, in 2017, the European Commission uh, required uh, Google+, uh, th Twitter, and I, I think uh, Facebook uh, to, uh, to comply with its uh, consumer protection rules. And, uh, and uh, I'm quoting here, uh, remove any fraud and scams appearing on their websites that could mislead consumers once they become aware of such practices, yeah, end of quote. Okay, I can see that my time is... Uh, uh, almost up, I tried to walk you through the solutions that, uh, that are proposed for, uh, for regulation uh, question on social media, but I think that these uh, solutions need to be applied jointly and not uh, separately, and they should interlink between each other in some way to have a better efficiency level. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Azad. And now it's time to move on our next speaker, Katrin Moresh. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, maybe first I uh, want to add that we actually had the plan to have um, a really nice state secretary from Germany here today, but unfortunately to all the election stuff happening in Germany, he couldn't make it, but I will try to give my best uh, for you as well. And maybe you're kind of lucky because uh, it's not that um, you will uh, be walked through to all the new German and European Union laws uh, in this field, because I will try to um, start with an example as I just focused on on the, the violating accounts and I tried to give you a bit of an example on you know the, the normal good accounts for for example influencers on um, on social media platforms and how they are violating 
also um, there were some rules because I think that's also a really um, important point. So um, the example I want to start is um, there has been in the middle of this year, there has been a case um, before the federal court um, uh, of justice in in Germany, and it went to, through different courts. And uh, I think it started 2018 or something, and it was finished um, in the middle of this year. And specifically, it was about three female influencers um, who, as influencers are doing, promoted um, their lifestyle and introduced products on, on um, their account. And then the, the German Association for Social, Social Competition um, yeah, we're kind of offended by uh, some posts they did because they said it's um, uh, unlawful advertisement and it's against the competition law and they wanted an um, injunction and charged warning costs. Um, so what basically happened with one of those influencers, uh, Kati Hummels, um, maybe some of you uh, know her, she's um, uh, really famous um, in Germany and she's uh, the wife of a German soccer player. So it's a kind of a couple which is known um, in a lot of different countries, not only in Germany. And um, so what she did was um, she posted um, a picture with a stuffed animal uh, she's which uh, like her her child is playing with and she then um, led through several links and clicking to the manufacturer of this of this uh, stuffed animal but um, according to the court findings she had not received any consideration for for doing this yeah so therefore she didn't have to label um that it were as it was an advertisement and that was what the what the federal court explained in in its rulings so um, of course as you see there wasn't kind of a rule that she had this labeling obligations but still of course you see that there is kind of a problem so the the big question is how can you protect consumers from differ you know from differing between what is advertisement and what's not is it advertisement only if you get if you get money for it or is it also you know supporting the companies in such a way that people will buy their stuff more even if you don't get get money and there's like a big problems within um german laws but of course you know the german laws are kind of um adapted from eu regulations and then each um, member state of the european union adapts it in its own country and so what we have is something called the Telia Media Act, where you have all those different laws on how you have to behave on social media platforms, but also we have competition law. And um, it's kind of difficult now to say which law is applying on, on those cases. You know, do you have competition law? Because some companies say, hey, um, they, they do advertising on their platform, but they don't, don't get money for it. And I can't afford or I don't have contacts to influencers that they do that for free for me. So I have to pay them. And then it's already ad advertising. And for others, um, it's it's not. And it's difficult to, to see where, where the line on those points is. And what the, the Tila Media Act is saying, only if... Um, you get consideration for it, only then it's commercial and only then you have labeling obligations. Uh, so we have a really big problem in, in this field and also the, the, what the, the court decided isn't really clear on, on any point of it. You know, you can't get, you really don't have a line for, for the influencers, but also for, for companies who don't really know what to do now. You can only see, okay, do I have to label it? Don't I have to label it? Which which is which is commercial and which not it's kind of really difficult to understand for for the the industry when you are allowed to have tab tags and when not so still it isn't really really unclear and also as i said from the competition perspective so um you know like we had those case from for two and a half years now and still it isn't really really clear and so the question is what do what do we what do we learn from it and I think there's a really um, important point where I would disagree with Azad because I don't think that self-regulating is the, the best 
point of doing it. Maybe it's, I don't know, my kind of <laughs> German sense. I think we are all about uh, regulations. Um, and I think that's really the, the, the best way to tackle this because we know from a lot of different areas and uh, not only about not only on social platforms or the digital stuff but also on climate and whatever that self-regulation isn't working at all but at least that's my point of view so i think that the only thing that really helps is having really clear rules and and not only have guidelines from the platforms but really really you know, really clear rules, not, of course, the European Union is trying to, to have those rules within the European Union, but also, as I watched, you raised a point that um, we have to do, we have to have those internationally, of course, that's um, the only way which it will work, because it is kind of an international point, but as this isn't working out most of the time in the end, because, for example, the USA is really liberal, and in the European Union, we want to have those those more strict rules I think it's really um, difficult to apply this so I think also the persons who are using the platforms have to look for themselves um, where they uh, that they have to um, apply those laws for themselves and that, that not only the, those companies have to look out for it so that the companies uh, like the social media platforms and also the influencers are reliable to and um, yeah, to check the laws and to go with them. So I think that's it. I, I would have have more points, but I think we can <laughs> go on now. Just, you just finished in time. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, we, have, we have also a little discussion in the chat. We have a comment from Jana. He says that, she says that this is usually a good point. Only online influencers nowadays are really powerful in making people to do believe in certain things. And also Shradra wrote a response to her. Yeah, maybe you can chat, you can check the chat. And if you have any questions from the audience so we can you can do it. You can use the raise hand function and you can ask your questions. Yeah, I think what um, Jenna, what you raised this point that um, that people are looking for the recommendations of the influencers and that this can lead to destructive consequences to the audience, but also to other businesses is kind of what I wanted um, to say from this, from also the, the competition perspective, you know, so um, the, um, the association which went to court was kind of coming from the competition perspective, because, um, yeah, as I said, you know, for example, I'm having um, a company where I sell uh, the best water in the world, and I happen to know um, an influencer because she's a friend of mine, we went to university or whatever together, and I say, hey, can you, you know, drink my water from time to time, and yeah, then, you know, promote it that it's the best water in the world, but I don't pay her because I know her. So where is, you know, where is the, the line? Of course, I don't have to pay her because I know her from somewhere. But other companies who also happen to have the best water in the world, as I do, they have to pay her. So it's from a competition perspective, really difficult for them to, yeah, to, to sell it in the same way as I do, because I get advertising for free and they would have to pay for it. So there's also um, a really difficult, difficult line. And of course, audience is, is really, for them, it's also really difficult to, to see through that, you know, of course, um, you see a lot of, a lot of influencers um, really don't think maybe sometimes about what they are doing, which is also for influencers who haven't been um, you know, on the field for, for many years, they maybe don't think about this and they, yeah, do something stupidly and just, you know, drink their water and say, yeah, it's the best water in the world, um, but they don't think about what they are, what they are doing. So it's kind of, of course, it's kind of hard to, you know, get to have them reliable for this, but I think it's also your obligation, which you have in every job in the world, you have obligations to check what you are allowed to do and what not. So you really have to have those regulations so that they that they know what they are allowed to do and what not. So yeah, that's that on that point. 
Thank you, Katrin. Maybe Azad also would like to comment on the issue of self-regulations, which Katrin didn't agree with. <laughs> yeah, I was going to do that. Uh, and uh, uh, Katrin didn't agree with me, but I'm, uh, I agree with Katrin. Uh, self-regulation uh, far from being perfect, perfect, and it's far from uh, uh, delivering uh, the, the the right level of uh, protection for consumers, uh, and uh, I agree with that. Uh, but why 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 I did say that the self regulation would be the best tool? Because uh, maybe this is more of a political. Many people assume that the, uh, any intervention from public side, I mean the state intervention or the jurisdictional uh, intervention, for example, EU intervention into private practice uh, is not good, uh, shouldn't be there at all. So that's why I think that uh, if, if, if uh, and I said this uh, in my speech, that uh, if applied sincerely and, and comprehensively, uh, this self-regulation maybe would be the key uh, to, uh, to uh, answer all, all or most of the questions uh, raised against this uh, consumer protection uh, in consumer protection topic. Yes, thank you. So, so maybe I see Jamie that you are writing uh, really interesting uh, things in the chat. I don't know if you can unmute yourself and if you can, you can, you can also, um, you know, just tell what you want. But I, I totally understand if you only want to write it in a chat. So I can maybe oh, try to. Yeah. Um, to um, read it out loud, or okay, we can. Uh, we, I, think I think we can also maybe do this. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, sure. Or or maybe we can also do that in the Q and A at the end. I don't know. Maybe Narmin, you can. It say would be. It would be better if we keep idea. it. It would be better if we keep it for Q and A session. If it's okay, also for Jana. Yeah. Okay. Great. So we can continue with our next policy question. Uh, which is what technical or legal measures have been or must be taken by social media companies and or governments respectively to ensure smooth operation of online business account without prejudice to, uh, to the personal data protection. Uh, so I give, uh, first I give floor to uh, Kauri. Kar? Um, hello, thank you so much for the invitation to this session. Um, well, um, I have been here a lot of me in this forum and in the discussions that um, there's a lot of um, actually debate about the regulations, about the GDPR that maybe is not being um, so effective when it is applied. Also, in different regions of the world, we have um, the problems that maybe when these kind of entrepreneurs are using um, social media such as Facebook or Instagram to sell their products or offer their services, um, we don't have like a lot of trust as consumers um, in how can we um, yeah, actually um, be secure or feel um, um, protected because we don't have any like guideline or nothing in this kind of markets that they were actually a huge, um, they, they had a lot of increase during the COVID times. And <clears throat> so um, that's why I, want, I would like to talk a bit more about um, new conceptions such as pro ethical design and also um, strategies instead of just um, trying to maybe create more articles or laws and try to um, yeah just regulate in such a hard law perspective uh, dynamic field and I would also like to include some concerns that we from the from a youth initiative that's called Youth for Policymakers we created this year it is um, well it is an initiative from the German Informatic Society you can find it in YIGF Dot de. We have different policy papers, and um, in these, um, in we have also one that's specifically about privacy, security, and vulnerable groups. And um, 
we were talking a group of young people with also policymakers and talking about concerns about that we are not feeling secure online and we have also for example um one of our papers says that the ignorance of ordinary citizens while utilizing the internet persists as a major concern Cybersecurity, cyber law and digital literacy must be mandatorily incorporated at the educational systems and um to increase the knowledge and awareness of end users on internet use, usage and security. So um, as a personal opinion, and also because of these concerns are, are arising, I think that it is necessary to empower the consumers, um, empower the citizens to assume ownership, not just of their choices, but also of course, of their personal data. And um, we also talk about of such a popular concept or um, approach, which is ethics by design, which which I think is okay because it like contributes in the in in the sense that we can create systems that from the pretty beginning are created to provide this privacy or these ethics, but at the same time, um, it could also have some critics because it shapes the courses of actions rather than the informational interface. This means that um, actually the, the agents that are participating in the markets, they didn't have like such an, um, they don't become conscious of what they are doing online. They also don't um, develop the skills necessary to, um, um participating in, in online systems and also they um don't know about the responsibilities as well as sellers and as buyers and i think that if we if we just um provide these pre-established designs um it is not helping on this educational and these um creation of awareness of the people that is actually um buying in these markets in or actually having a digital identity. And um, that's why I think that if we start to include a pre-ethical design approach, um, be, it, it would be a bit better for these instances, like for education and also for creating awareness, because it could um, provide more in, in ownership for the people, for the um, also educate the agents that are participating in online activities and um, make them more critical about their choices, um, about the responsibilities that they are assuming. And also I think this could create a way more um, trustworthy scenario for the people and and yeah, that actually the internet become a bit more safe and like secure for everyone. So um, some recommendations that in this sense um, could be established would be um, development of principle-based ethical codes, um, that this could be through negotiation, including um, the agents of these markets as the interlocutors. Um, because they know exactly what's happening in these kind of um, commercial relations. On the second um, point would be the val validation, verification, and uh, evaluation of how the dynamics on these kind of platforms are occurring, as they are actually very chain changeable and um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in each of the um, transactions. Um, so it will be good if uh, the each context of the meaning of the principles in the ethical code is really defined, and also if there is an implementation of trans translational tools that could uh, make a transition from the principles to the practice. And on the last point, it would be also um, the conduction of regular audits that um, these would be um, in the best of the cases applied to the behavior of the whole company and not just to the um, uh, product at the end because um, yeah i think it's also a good practice when we try to um to promote the ethical responsibility in the whole company or the whole um platform than just uh, in 
uh, in one product or like one specific service. Um, so I think it could be a bit more holistical. And so, yeah, for my position, the idea, it would be like to educate the consumer, to make them ownership, to empower them, to know about their rights, about the responsibilities, and to, I think this is the way to help create a more secure internet. And well, in a, in a couple of minutes, I need to leave because I have another session at this moment as well. So thank you, but it was a very interesting discussion. Thank you so much, Kari. Uh, and if you have any questions for Kari as he, uh, he has to leave us, uh, you can write down in the chat or you can ask now. If you don't have any questions for now, so we can continue with our next Speaker, Shratra. Yes, thanks, Narmit. So I'm going to be discussing the legal aspect of controlling and analyzing these businesses about how they can protect the data of the individual while they're also carrying out the business online. So the internet economy is coming under scrutiny these days because of the exploitation of consumer data by platforms without appropriate consent and privacy protocols. There's another set of concerns that relate to misinformation, surveillance, accountability, and the disproportionate size and influence of all these platforms in addition to the consent and privacy discussion that is already existing. So all these have to come from a user end of the equation, from the user side. And it's often overlooked about how we deal with service providers while we're discussing very important issues such as hate speech, such as harmful content, the misinformation and the disinformation that is being spread online. We fail to analyze it from a consumer-based perspective when we're discussing about businesses. So micro, small and medium scale enterprises that are hopping onto the internet these days and the businesses that are already existing on the internet offer a wide variety of goods and services. They're extremely popular because of the fact that they cater to the local needs of communities since the micro and the target to a specific group or a specific population and the larger customer segment or the consumer segment which was previously only physical relating to particular shops now is moving to an online wider base and in economies that are developing such as india pakistan sri lanka their role in job creation their role in innovation in productivity these it does not need any reiteration because they're leading to new jobs every day however there is a small dichotomy between the dominant enterprises that already exist within this realm and the small scale micro enterprises that are coming up in this regard. And the possible adoption of discriminatory practices and the online realm is something that has to be considered for these small scale enterprises that are coming up. So one of the few things that needs to be pointed out is the favor of specific providers, the unreasonable pricing that deters these small businesses. All these come within the ambit of these small businesses coming online. Now, with respect to the concern of data protection, this becomes relevant, especially because since the micro and small scale enterprises have to cut down on costs to ensure that they compete with these large scale platforms, they end up compromising on the data protection of the consumers in the first place. Now that is extremely problematic. There are several issues that have dealt with uh, this particular issue. There are several authorities that have dealt with it, especially in the case of India, there is the Competition Commission of India that deals with these issues. Now, the concern with the competition commissions and such other authorities and jurisdictions is that they deal with these issues on a case to case basis, which means there are thousands of cases that are being left out that are either not reported because people do not deem that information to be relevant or important, or these cases are not considered due to the fact that their impact is a little low compared to other large scale companies. Now, another aspect that we need to understand in the case of other jurisdictions, this has been starkly different. For example, we see the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, which released a preliminary report on digital platforms inquiry in December 2018. It recognized the critical role of popular platforms in enabling businesses and the impact that they have on consumer protection rights and the data protection laws. 
So they had to ensure that the platforms determine the order of appearance of the content of their various service providers. Now, this data protection comes from two perspectives. One is from a service provider perspective as well as a consumer perspective. Another legal angle that we see is with respect to Competition Commission's report on competition policy for the digital era. Now, it argues about the regulatory role that is needed to ensure the protection of these businesses and their complementary services. And these complementary services deal with the large scale interaction between consumers and these online businesses. So what we're seeing is the recommendations that these dominant platforms should have a responsibility to ensure that their rules do not impede the free flow of goods, the undistorted or the vigorous competition without an objective justification. So what we're seeing and what we're calling for is for a level playing field to exist in the market. And that can happen only through proper regulation, proper channels. While India did try to go for the self-regulatory approach, approach that Azad was talking about, we saw that with respect to the protection of privacy and data, that was a major failure because the companies, large scale companies focused only on their profit margins and the protection of data was not given even a second thought. So then they brought in this concept of personal data protection bills as well as other privacy bills. And one good thing about these bills was that they did that through a multi-stakeholder process where they called for comments from all the stakeholders in the companies. However, the ultimate decision was still by the state authorities and the amount of control that they still exercise over this data is huge. Now, those are the few concerns that need to be considered that I wanted to preliminarily point out in my beginning. And if there are any particular concerns out of which needs to be elaborated upon, you can put that in the chat box and we can continue the conversation from there. With that, I'll hand it over to you, Norman. Thank you, Shetra. Thank you for your speech. And as Chadra mentioned, if you have any questions on, on policy num question number two, and you can address your questions. If you don't have any questions, yeah, okay, we have a question from Jamie. If you, Jamie, if you wanna speak up, you can, or if you don't want, I can. Uh, uh, yeah, ask, I can, yeah, I can speak as long as the audio is working. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, so I'm, I, <laughs> I'm from Australia, so um, uh, I don't work for the ACCC, but in another part of Australian government. So I just wanted to clarify, did you think that the recommendations in the ACCC report were, um, do you think they're positive? Do you think they're heading in the right direction? Or I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, so when we're discussing about these concerns from an Indian angle, usually we take the European perspective to be in the uh, in the positive end, like we see that as something that we should go towards. And I think right now while we're discussing the policy concerns as well as the competition concerns, I think the report is in the right direction according to me. If there are any specific concerns that you want to point out that we can maybe discuss upon right now. Thank you. No, I, I, I am not familiar with the report, um, so no, nothing specific. Katrine also has a question. It's uh, not really a question, it's more of a comment, um, because uh, I really, um, for me, it's really funny that um, a lot of you and a lot of people who are not from the European Union refer to, for example, the GDPR is a really great example and that they think something like this could be implemented in their own countries because it's working really great. And of course, we are really proud of um, that we have those regulations. But what I see and what I think is, um, uh, I no, I wouldn't call it funny because it's actually not funny at all, but uh, that a lot of consumers are actually annoyed about regulations they now have to uh, go through for example we have those really um yeah we have a lot of regulations about about cookies and how how the cookie banners have to look and you know how you have to accept them and all that stuff which is basically amazing for consumer protection um but um a lot of people are just annoyed about that and are saying we don't uh, we don't we don't have to do that and i already click yes i accept everything and it's just um just annoying and also um smaller companies are really annoyed um about um those whole stuff with mailing lists and that stuff so it's really funny to see that a lot of other countries are looking to those regulations and say that they are really great but that people 
uh, within, I mean, mostly Germany, are just um, annoyed by those regulations because they think they are smart enough to to get uh, the job done by their by themselves and that they don't need regulatory um re regulatory protection. So something which, as Jarvis said, I think was really interested on in that that you have those more ethical approach and that you also have responsibility by the consumers. Um, you know, through like digital literacy, if you call it like that, that people are not maybe are not so annoyed anymore about those rules because they maybe understand more why they why they are why they are in place. And also, I think um, what Chandra, what you said that we have those those law problems that it's case on case problematics. I think that's also something which uh, we saw on my example in like uh, the first question that you don't really have rules which apply to to every case and that that's really difficult because that makes the whole process of um, seeing which rules can apply uh, really difficult for um, especially smaller companies because they don't really know what is applying to them. And uh, Jamie, as you said, yeah, it's really um, yeah, it's really nice about seeing uh, the consumer experiences, um, which is you know I try at least in my in my circle, uh, family, friends, the people I can reach when they say, oh, it's so annoying, and GDPR go away with that to to explain to them why it is really important. But um, of course, it would be better if they just would understand why we really have that <laughs> in place um, and. Yeah, so maybe if you apply something like this in your countries, uh, I don't know, go with a, a really good campaign um, <laughs> about why you have those. <laughs> I think one of the excuses that they usually come up with is that uh, let's wait and watch what is happening in other countries and now the waiting and watching has exceeded over 20 years and we're like, we're still waiting for a proper legislation. About time we started doing something about it. Thank you all. Uh, okay, so it's now it's time to move on to our next policy question, which is about what legal or other remedies are and must be available to compensate the damage to consumers by fake business accounts. And I would like to give the floor to Azad. Me again? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, yes, thank you, Nermin, again. Uh, I think uh, this question is closely related to the first one. Uh, that's the question of regulation. Uh, the more we have social media companies and the, and the businesses operating through them uh, regulated, uh, the more chance we have to compensate uh, consumers, victim consumers. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the more the, the restricted the, uh, the enforced uh, this regulation, uh, the more questions will be raised against this public intervention into into private practice. As I said uh, in the in the first question, so I need uh, I think we need to find the right balance here. Uh, on the one hand, we need to make sure that these um, uh, these fake online businesses or fraudulent activities do not go. Um, how to say uh, unnoticed uh, and unpunished, but uh, on the on the other hand, we need to make sure that uh, we don't uh, we don't uh, put unreasonable burden of compensation on social media. For example, uh, in, in some cases, the the, uh, the provisions of uh, uh, Chinese law uh, puts liability on, on business operators, which can include social media companies, uh, to compensate victims of. Uh, fraud, even if those companies are not the, the direct perpetrators uh, of these illegal activities. Um, yeah, I, I'm still on, on the opinion that in an ideal world, uh, self-regulation should be sufficient uh, to, to tackle consumer protection, even if, if, it, if, it, if it's not perfect. Uh, these platforms uh, should ensure that the accounts on, on their platforms uh, employ the uh, Set, employ a satisfactory, maybe even high uh, standards of consumer protection and uh, address all, uh, all challenges uh, on consumer protection. Uh, but uh, in practice, 
uh, using a private or uh, public enforcement tools, uh, it becomes necessary uh, to, to overcome any uh, consumer pro uh, right uh, violations. Uh, more effective type of uh, private uh, enforcement is uh, collective actions. And as I, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the New Deal for Consumers uh, policy package of the European Union uh, provides uh, uh, how uh, collective actions can contribute to improve the uh, involvement of uh, consumer associations in the protection of uh, consum uh, consumer rights or the user rights on social media. For, uh, for instance, uh, in some countries, uh, for, ex for example, in uh, Italy, Belgium, and I think in Portugal, some uh, consumer associations uh, have come together uh, to bring an action against Facebook uh, uh, against their uh, consumer rights policies. Uh, but still, these actions uh, are not quite freely uh, available everywhere and, uh, and for everyone. So that's why uh, public enforcement, is, I think, often uh, becomes the number one choice of uh, consumers. Um, now, one of the most uh, common uh, pieces of advice that, uh, that's given to uh, victim consumers these days is contacting the bank uh, or, or money transfer uh, application and asking to reverse the transaction they just did. Uh, and another one, uh, another recommendation is complaining to, to uh, the authorities. Both of these uh, pieces of uh, advice advice uh, need for um, there are need for a collaboration uh, between uh, social media platforms and uh, authorities but uh, it, I think it's safe to say that um, unfortunately uh, this such type of uh, collaboration won't be happening for every single case of business uh, online, uh, online uh, business fraud uh, on, on social media. However, there are some uh, good examples of uh, handling the case of uh, consumer, uh, consumer rights violations. Uh, for example, um, although not strictly designed for social media, uh, authorized push payment uh, framework of the United Kingdom is a good example uh, in this case. Uh, authorized push payment scams are when um, customers are tricked to, to pay uh, uh, some some amount of money into the bank account uh, that they believe uh, belongs to a legitimate payee, uh, but uh, in fact it's controlled by, uh, for example, a criminal. So uh, under this framework, uh, banks or, or or payment service providers uh, that are member of this initiative that are signed up to this initiative uh, fully reimburse their uh, customers. Um, if they uh, if they fall victim of uh, authorized uh, authorized push payments uh, and if they are not to blame and by this i uh, i mean provided that they uh, they did everything of them to avoid uh, As I, I'm sorry to interrupt. before falling we had an we had an internet yes. issue can you please repeat what you said before just your last sentence maybe yes yes last sentence uh, what I Talking about authorized push payment platforms can uh, can use uh, a similar approach uh, users uh, on on the services they provide uh, by, by uh, compensating them. or another uh, if they uh, if they acted reasonably cautious uh, another potential source of uh, remedy available for consumers i think is dedicated uh, dispute resolution systems uh, people would be happy uh, to report fraudulent activities to social media companies and uh, and expect a remedy just from them and nobody else uh, it should take into account that when when talking about uh, uh, consumer rights violations we don't limit it to 
fun little uh, frauds or, or uh, fake accounts or uh, is of uh, low quality uh, or I'm, uh, I'm sorry as that I have to interrupt you because of the internet glitch maybe you can continue uh, on that where the right to return is on me yes Narmin uh, maybe you can continue on this issue on the Q and A session because of the internet glitch. It's not clear what you're saying. Uh, I don't know why, why it happens, but okay, uh, I can maybe continue in the Q and A session. Yes, yes. Uh, so I would like to move to our next speaker, Catherine, to talk on the on this post question. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I will uh, jump in on that. And as we know, it wouldn't be a proper online meeting if there wouldn't be technical problems. So, <laughs> yeah, I think what um, I think there was a tip in the chat. Maybe as that you can later turn off your video. So then maybe it um, it is better so that we can only hear you. Uh, that normally helps. But um, of course, uh, I will uh, jump in now, and we can. Um, get back to you later. So when we are thinking about um, how to compensate uh, people if they are uh, frauded by, uh, by, by fake accounts online, we actually do have a lot of rules. For example, of course, I'm talking about, about German laws. We have a lot of them who are um, there to compensate people um, if they get frauded. They weren't specifically on on uh, on on online fraud, but of course this is also something which is coming into place. And now, as we have those uh, more and more, and because of that, in um, twenty like next year, twenty twenty two, there will be some a lot of new regulations within um, the European Union. As that already mentioned, that we have this consumer sales directive, uh, which was in place for um, some years now, starting um, I think twenty fifteen or something about that. And um, we we now have a lot of new laws coming in. And so parts of this consumer sales directive will be replaced by digital products directive, by the Digital Services Act and a lot of new stuff because the European Union uh, just has started um, its digital decade because um, yeah they were seeing that the internet is here now and that maybe some regulations have to be um, adapted to, to problems um, coming uh, with that. And if you now have um, have fraud of um, uh, of uh, with uh, online fake accounts, of course you can go, you know, to to civil courts, and then you have all those regulations how you can get your money back. But the the most problem which we see at court isn't that we. Uh, don't have the, the, the laws and rules to give people their money back, but that the problem is that we don't find those persons, that you don't um, know who created those uh, fake accounts, who's reliable for them. And also maybe that those people are not within Germany, but they are somewhere around the world, which makes it totally difficult to proceed against them through um, a civil court, which would, have the 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 material to give you um your money back so that's the the biggest problem we have so the question is how can we how can we solve this problem how can we have rules which uh, will help people throughout the world giving getting their money for example back but of course it's not only about about money which you maybe pay for stuff where you will never get but it's also about uh, the data you give them of course what they do with that is a total uh, different matter so that's kind of a problem you know from the real from the real world if you're sitting in court and you have this problem we don't have someone we can uh, we can you know have accountable for that so the question is how can we make the, the platforms accountable for this and that's like a really also really difficult uh, difficult question because there is something um which you know have been there for years which i think started by 
those streaming platforms and um, if or if someone is uh, hosting a Wi-Fi point and then people are doing shit in your Wi-Fi, if you are you accountable for this? And of course, we had this privilege that you are not accountable for this because I mean you are doing a good thing and um, people are using your stuff for doing uh, illegal things. But I think if you are thinking about platforms who are co commercial and they earn money with that, of course. Uh, I really think that we can make them accountable for this so that they have to pay for it, maybe, if not, um, if the person is not found, the person who created this fake account, because it's the responsibility of the platforms. Uh, of course, this is uh, really for fat because it also um, would make those uh, platforms accountable for a lot of stuff. But I think that's maybe the only way we can we can tackle um, tackle these problems. and. Of course, we see that um, in the terms and conditions of platforms, they say don't create fake accounts, um, blah, blah, blah. But of course, as we see, it's not working at all again. So uh, we have to go to the next step. And if platforms are held accountable for what is happening on their websites, even fraud, they um, maybe will check all those stuff more. And of course, um, something as that already raised is that you, you know, have the consumers um, see frauds and then do red flagging or whatever to to show the platforms this. Of course, that's the most um, important way of doing it. If I see something online and I think mm, that could be a fake account, I flag it, and then platforms have to have to remove it quickly. But to to even see that it's maybe a fake account, you have to be literate to to do that, and that's like a really important important point in, in consumer protection. So we have to have consumer protection centers um, involve and provide them more information about the, those, those issues so they can contribute to educational work and so that consumers could recognize those platforms or fake accounts on the platforms, then maybe flag them and then the platforms have to remove them if they don't do that and people are frauded by them, then the platform could be responsible to pay them back. Um, that could be maybe a way uh, where you can get a hang of this problem because as I said, it's really um, difficult in the real world to um, you know, apply those regulations onto real cases. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I am... I see that someone wants to ask a question from the yes. Katowice, from Katowice. Okay, you can ask your question. Um, thank you. My name is Nema Lugangira. I'm a member of parliament from Tanzania. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask a question in the sense that um, we're talking about how can we um, protect consumers from fake online businesses. So I just wanna get an understanding on what is your best advice to um, users from developing countries like Tanzania and other African countries in the sense that where our legal framework is not where it is compared to the EU, how can the, how can the social media platforms um, somewhat um, support and, and, and enhance the, the, the security of people doing business online? Thank you. Kastrin, you want to start answering the question? Uh, yeah, I can. I can try to start. What you just said is um, so is so important. I just you know shortly realized that there is a really gap between um, you know my my place of work and where I'm coming from to as you said some uh, developing countries. I realized that because I mentored to someone who's doing a project in India and I was totally easy on yet yeah, just do it like this and that and she was like oh Catherine we, we don't have those rules and those um and those ideas here so I have to go from a different angle so um what maybe is an idea about that is that you can try to have some people maybe from governments but also from NGOs if you have some who are active maybe in this field, try to really have consumer protection centers or something similar, really try to give education and literacy to maybe small companies, but also to, to 
to people who are using social media platforms, maybe in a way that you uh, send someone into your into a village and then you have a workshop there and maybe then those people again can try to educate their peers about it again. So maybe to really sensible and sensibilize them for for those issues and also yeah really help those those companies maybe who are active also um, in that kind of frame maybe not through regulations but yeah through education i don't know if that could be could be an idea in in, in this case yeah i i want to add something uh, i i totally uh, agree with the question on, on educating consumers point uh, and uh, and this is very important. I mean, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the question was about the legal framework uh, perspective, but uh, educating consumers also will add, it will add a lot uh, to, to fight against uh, any, uh, any violations of consumer rights, I think. And, uh, and I think the, an another thing that can be uh, considered here is, uh, is uh, getting is uh, uh, getting the getting your uh, legal framework or legislation uh, in, in in line or similar in, in similar line with the with the legislation of uh, developed countries uh, like EU or other uh, developed uh, jurisdictions. Uh, this is uh, this is not uh, this is should not be applied uh, without considering the le uh, le local. Uh, legal uh, atmosphere or environment, but um, this can uh, help a lot uh, to, to, to enforce the rights of uh, consumers uh, in line with the uh, or, or similar uh, uh, similarly in line with the uh, framework in European Union or other uh, de developed uh, jurisdictions. Thank you, Azad. First, I would like to hear Shadra. And then we will continue with Kestrin. Right. I had a few things to point out. Uh, the first one was the active participation of users themselves. And this can come in many forms. Uh, the one that I was thinking of was in the grievance redressal mechanism, that asking these companies for a strong grievance redressal mechanism is one of the basic steps, or this can lay a proper foundation for it to go forward in the future, right? And one other aspect that I wanted to discuss and elaborate a little further upon was with respect to the digital literacy that uh, Catherine stressed in her answer. So the problem or the concern that we see these days in the developing economies, and there is uh, the, uh, the studies about uh, the internet as well as the access to internet, access while it remains a major problem, one other concern that is coming up is the literacy aspect of internet. So people, now that internet is becoming a little more, a little cheaper, people have access to internet, but the problem is they don't know how to use it. Their knowledge of internet is limited to social media companies or even Facebook or WhatsApp alone. They don't know that there is another world out there that they can use and they can educate themselves. So creating these grassroots organizations or empowering people to educate themselves can be one of the strongest steps that we can take in this regard. And the media companies can go a long way in aiding that by promoting such activities about educating themselves on their platforms themselves. So that is what I wanted to add. Kathleen, you want to continue or you wanted to ask the, the woman about the question? Yeah, I wanted to ask her a question, actually, but I see that, uh, sh that she uh, left uh, because I was, you know, sometimes I'm wondering if um, for like for my understanding, sometimes I don't really know, you know, if what other countries are having um, in place um, as laws and regulations. So it's sometimes difficult to to understand that. And that's, I mean, one of the, the biggest problems also, which we have on you know global events like the global igf because we are coming all from totally different stages some people are coming from zero and other countries having a lot of regulations in this field so yeah that's um that's also why it is difficult to have global uh at global rules and laws uh, because we are on so um, different points and we have so different frameworks so that's also um something which is in every part, uh, really difficult if you want to have global perspectives, I guess. 
exactly that's what i guess to my opinion that's what it creates a conflict let's say in the sense so now it's i would like to thank you to all our speakers for their presentations and now we can move to our q a session it will be about uh, 12 minutes we can uh, get the questions from the audience if i'm not mistaken i promise to one person jana and i think also jamie um at the beginning mentioned something um yes. uh, where we maybe can back can go back to uh if you if you want I think, Jamie, you had an example about um, also grocery re retailers and that stuff. So if you if you want to go back to that, we, we could um, totally do that. But um, we can also continue with something something else. Um, yeah, I'm happy, I'm happy to talk about that. But if you like, but it's to be honest, I, it was basically just an example. I remembered from studying um, different regulatory tools a while ago. Um, and um, I also remember finding a diagram which kind of uh, talked about basically the, the different regulatory models and when they're most suited, like self-regulation versus kind of co-regulation versus kind of prescriptive. And it was all about kind of the interests of those being regulated. So I think it's, yeah, it's, I guess I'm just trying to say that it's not sensible to make blanket statements like this kind of regulation never works. Um, because it might work in a certain situation. It's just about knowing the situations where it would work best. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think that's uh, probably a point to something I said that it never works. Uh, yeah, I totally agree with you that of course there are uh, cases where where this can where this can work. Um, maybe I also have to add that I'm uh, politically very active um, in uh, in Germany, and of course a lot of uh, perspectives we have here is on you know you really have to regulate a lot of stuff but of course and um, there are a lot of fields where this can this can also this can also work but um you know from my perspectives i think uh something which really um is important to mostly every person uh, on this world <laughs> um internet and social media for especially maybe for for younger persons i think is something where self-regulation maybe stops if it um, is important to to a lot of people um but uh, yeah that's you know that's just my opinion but uh, yeah as you said there are also examples where this is working um and for example cross retailers maybe is a good example for that I should add, though, yeah, there are plenty of examples where self-regulation doesn't work. I'm not, I'm not saying it works all the time either. No, it's, uh, yeah, and I think perhaps that's the, maybe that's the, that's where it gets a bad reputation is the times when it hasn't worked and people are really aware of those and then people see it as a like a soft or an ineffective tool, but um, which it can be, but then equally it can work in those narrow situations that I mentioned. Yeah, true, but maybe it's the question, and I would, um, I, I think that's something important because like on the process we sometimes start with let's try self-regulation and then after two years we see oh that didn't work and then we have to implement rules and implement rules is like a really long process sadly most of the time um, as, I mean it is for example in Europe I don't know how it is in other countries but it's a really long process so if you then have those process again for which takes I don't know one and a half years at the end you have three to four years um, and then it, you know, three to four years in like internet uh, time, that's, that's like hundred of years. So starting with self-regulations and then see that it's not working and then, you know, have to go to the, to the real rules. I think that's um, a process which is um, taking really long. So how do we, how do we, you know, separate where self-regulation maybe could work and where we really have to start with the laws directly i don't see i i think that's a difficult that's difficult to decide yeah i guess it's maybe about going in with eyes wide open about um mm. when when it will actually work and when it won't but but it is always hard because um you don't want to be accused of being too heavy-handed i feel like sometimes it's almost like you have to have the self-regulation it has to fail that they then you are given a mandate to proceed like, True. <laughs>
If there is no any question from the audience, I can ask my question. Actually, it's somehow answered. Um, for example, in the EU level, we, you have a uh, regulation like a GDPR, like an online sales directives, which uh, online uh, business accounts are in compliance most in most cases, let's say. But for developing countries like in my like my country Azerbaijan, we only have one uh, law, which is the uh, law about the protection of the consumers. And I don't know in to what extent these online business accounts are in compliance with this law maybe Azad can address this question because uh, in most cases as I know also the um, for example Azad touched upon the uh, the way of online mess payment method that maybe they can prove but if if they pay cash so how how it can be regulated and how if they they see they see that they are uh, they met with a fraud, business account which steps should be taken yeah thank, thank you for your question i mean very uh, interesting question i'll try to make it short uh, because i don't want to uh, ruin any more our uh, session with my internet uh, connection uh, weak internet connection um, uh, okay. yeah that's a, a very good question because uh, the uh, our law on uh, on the protection of consumers is an old law, uh, I think from 1992 uh, or three, if I'm not mistaken, 1992 or three. Uh, so it, it, obviously it doesn't uh, take uh, uh, internet developments or uh, IT developments into, uh, into uh, attention. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the law uh, only generally uh, covers this uh, question. I mean, the protection of consumers, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't pay very much attention in uh, on uh, uh, on electronic uh, consumer protection on the, on the on the e-commerce uh, side of uh, of trade. Um, uh, the, the the practice is uh, uh, consumers can can take uh, can bring action against. Uh, for example, sellers, businesses, uh, in just ordinary way, again, uh, I, I mean, the, in the in the traditional way uh, against uh, these sellers, uh, and the and the, the, the there are challenges. Uh, there are courts, for for example, there are cases that courts do not know how to implement this, uh, uh, how to how to respond to this question of online. Uh, fraud, for example, uh, in the context of the law of on consumer protection, because uh, uh, as I said, it only covers uh, the traditional uh, consumer protection. So there is a, a, a big uh, need uh, to reform uh, the consumer protection law, uh, the, the competition law, uh, advertisement law, and uh, all, all this kind of laws. Uh, but uh, we are still in the in the process. Uh, I, I know that uh, there is a there there are discussions uh, of long years in the parliament uh, about these reforms. But we are not still there. But hopefully uh, we will be in uh, in uh, soon. I think I believe. Thank you, Azar. Thank you. So if you don't have any questions, Katrin suggests that she can also raise the point about taxes and the platforms it's not only about taxes but something i just thought about during our discussion so we sometimes like it refers to the point that we don't really have laws applying to to, to the whole world so we only have laws within i don't know the countries and then of course the um you know australia is having different laws and now we have like the german influencer and they are living in Dubai because, um, of course, they don't have to pay high taxes there and maybe laws um, which would be in place in Germany, which are really hard, aren't in place for their work there. So what do we what do we make out of this? You know, that's something because I think that if you are a German influencer and you're living in Dubai, but your main audience is um, is in Germany because you do all your online stuff in German. So of course, only German or Austri Austrian people could understand what you're talking about. Then you have to be, then you have to 
apply the rules which are in stake in Germany for, for the platforms. Of course, that's the, that's the first thing. But the second one is that a um, lot of, um, for example, influencers or companies are moving their, their like where they are seated to other countries where they have um, lower taxes because of course they are on the internet so they can work from everywhere so to avoid like high taxes they have and kind of what we always have here is that like taxes are like the hard sword for um for people and so they 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 move away but i think it is to be honest it's really it's really not fair and not working because i don't think if you have like your main people your main followers in germany of course you have to pay for example your taxes in germany because if you uh, if you just go to um, a different country but you still work um, in germany i think that's a really big problem because a lot of influencers are doing this at the moment but what we also see is that you know that is kind of made public by uh, different associations and by other people they're raising this point and they start to make those influencers accountable for what they are doing they make make them accountable for you know not paying taxes as they should uh, as they should do to live in dubai which is um, a bit critical um if you are coming from from our ethics and then um yeah, that's something I just wanted to raise because I think that's a really interesting, interesting point within this this whole problem that you can work from everywhere and that um, you just apply the, 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 the laws from the place you are living and not the laws from the place where you're actually your actual workplace is. So, yeah, that's just a point I wanted to raise because I was wondering about um this uh, um, a lot and yeah it totally is a question for lawyers um and yeah but i you know i'm trying uh, you know i'm thinking about this um a lot from from my lawyer perspective or from my from my law perspective but also from like the political perspective because those laws of course are a political sort i just have one little question so as far as I know in regarding the EU tax law, if even if the person lives in another country, if has, he has professional connect, connection with the countries that he has a limited tax liability. So even if he operates, he she operates online, in this case, as far as I understood, it's an open question for open issue for the EU countries. Yeah. There is yeah, no so um yeah, so that that's a point for like normal companies, you know, companies who are selling, I don't know, classes or shampoo or whatever, but uh, within, for example, influencers, this is still not really solved in, in a in a really good way. So that's mostly the point for, for them, not for, not for, you know, normal companies. Yes. Okay, we had to raise hand. Okay, Jana, you can speak up. It was from me. It was really interesting to hear about the, you know, tax things raised by Catherine earlier. This is Jana from Hong Kong for the record. I just wanted to add some small things about the situations because I think um, forget about the online inference. It's a new industry. I think people living in one place or working working for another country targeting some audience in the third country it's it's something more common these days especially when internet gets really popular i i think people can can actually work from anywhere and then as a consumer we can also buy things or consume any products from anywhere because basically internet it's has no boundary somehow so I think it's also important that we, especially for some platform that has a stronger market share these days, I think they should take the responsibility to regulate a little bit more of their platform because in certain extent, these platforms are a privately owned a public space. And so I guess, for example, Facebook, Instagram, they have to regulate in that way. Because I think nowadays, Instagram has its features of letting people having an account, making it feature it as a shop. But then I think 
at the moment, they don't really require you to actually have a business license to register such features. And so I think, you know, to make it more reliable, these platforms should, should take in a step forward to help regulate the things, especially when people tend to actually buying stuff anywhere or working from anywhere. It's not limited to really traditional way as thinking how the government should regulate certain things in for their own country only at this moment, because I think our world is indeed changing. And so the way we think should change a little bit also. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, here I should conclude our session as the time is almost up. Uh, and I would like to give, to share with you the takeaways from this session, which is prepared by our reporter. So uh, the first takeaway is that there is an urgent need for the external reg regulation of online business accounts, even though it can be accompanied by self-regulation. Whether the ex external or self-regulation, international corporation, as well as the cooperation between states and private social media companies is necessary. Local and international consumer organizations can be an intermediary. The models like in the Commission, European Commission or Australia can be followed, but some countries may need a more tailored protection regime. Such approaches in the protection can work better than following legal transpience from developed countries. Alternatives to the pre-established designs in the protection that are not accessible to everyone can be considered, such as the pro design in the regulation of online business accounts. Even though the problem of identifying the fraudulent actions is not a regulation problem per se, but rather a practical matter, the liability of social media platforms can be considered in the cases of fraud. Legal regulation must not be the only solution and it must be accompanied by educating consumers, where again the role of consumer organizations is undeniable. Uh, I would like to thank you all. Thank you for our speakers for their presentations and thank you uh, to our audience for their questions. If you uh, I address to the audience that if you have more questions, our uh, speakers can uh, write their contact details so you can reach out them with your questions. And um, I hope that you have learned and enjoyed this session. Uh, so this ends actually our session if anybody wants to say something you can you can because we have almost one to two minutes i just wanted to say um a quick thank you also to the audience and to be um active and not only to have questions but also uh, raise some um some of um, your points that was uh, really interesting thank you for that Also, I want to thank uh, other speakers uh, and other uh, the session uh, organizers and the audience uh, for all the input we had today and all the contribution. Uh, and again, sorry for my uh, unstable internet connection.